Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially, and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever meet them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, You'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything. I want to shout out a couple of our sponsors, Private Money Club. Um, they created an app that was basically like the dating app uh, for hard money loans. And for the people who need money and the people who have money, you want to uh, connect with the person who either has a deal or you're looking to make money on a deal, Private Money Club is your answer. The cool thing is, for me, I'm a relationship guy. As uh, this young man knows that's on the podcast right now, I make friends out of every single person in my my friend Chris Nago has come up with this private money club. It has been absolutely phenomenal. Also, check him out uh, for money school. I wish that I would have known about money when I was growing up. Uh, I wish that I would have been financially literate. I learned by the school of hard knocks. I wish I would have learned from money school. So check out chrisnagel.com. And when you go to, uh, all these links are in the bios. When you go to privatemoneyclub.com uh, uh, forward slash Kelly, you can put in the uh, code Kelly500 and you'll get a little gift too. Um, but let's get to the man of the hour. The real reason why we're here. The only reason why I put cologne on for a <laughs> podcast, for a virtual podcast. I have cologne on today. I hope you could smell me. I wore my chain today. I even put on my pinky ring and I'm holding it up for all my YouTube followers there. I'm wearing a pinky ring. I got my watch on that my wife gave me when I was uh, for my anniversary and I had to look smooth because this is the man who makes everybody look smooth. This is a man that it's so cool because of the, the commercial that you saw with the hideout. We said we get to know people before we ever need them. And this is exactly like him and I's relationship. We ended up in Salt Lake together. We were at a, a, a private gentleman, no, I, I can't even say, I can't say private gentleman's club. That sounds too bad. Um, it's a, a, a private club for gentlemen, not the kind of uh, uh, club that you guys are thinking about that you're listening. But we were sitting down and, and we made fast friends. He came up and he was just connected with me and it wasn't like he was looking for anything from me. He was looking to contribute to me. But what, we've, what I found was is over the time of becoming friends with this young man, I realized that he is one of the top, top in his whole industry and he's the one that makes everyone else look smooth throughout the country and throughout the nation. Um, this man is incredible. He's the founder of Haberdasher uh, Custom Clothing. He's the host of the top-rated uh, The Gentleman Project podcast. That was a mouthful. And he's just an incredible human being. Married for 20 years, got four beautiful children, and um, he's always looking to contribute to other people. Please welcome to the uh, podcast, Mr. Kirk Chug. Man, thanks. That's quite the intro. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're very kind. You're very kind. And we should all go to the hideout and we should all support my good friend, Chris Noggle as well. So 
<laughs> well, the the cool thing is when we were talking about the high, the hideout, and I know we didn't get a chance to uh, have you in September. We're going to have you this coming September because the new dates just dropped. For those of you who are thinking about it, it's twenty second through the twenty fourth of September, two thousand twenty three. Um, but the reason why for me connecting with you was so important is because you weren't on the take. And I noticed this, and I've asked people about you. You're constantly just contributing to every single person with no back end to you. Where did you learn that? And how can we uh, get the secret sauce? Oh, man. Uh, I think I learned it out of necessity uh, because I, when I started my business, I really didn't have a, a natural network. Uh, where I started working, I didn't know anybody. So I plugged in and I, I think I did the, the numbers one day and I networked like 90 to 95% of my working hours I spent uh, with other people just like they were not customers. They weren't potential customers. They were just people who were out trying to kind of, you know, hustle and, and build their business, make sales um, and, and build relationships. And what I found was when I checked into this idea of just serving others with no anticipation of getting anything in return. I created this de facto sales force for myself because anytime anybody brought up, Oh, you know, I need a new suit. I needed a suit for my wedding. I, you know, I got a new job or my wardrobe. I lost a bunch of weight. I need to refresh my wardrobe. Every one of those people that I met in those opportunities in those networking groups, they would say, I know the guy, I know the guy you need to talk to. And it wasn't because they'd ever bought anything from me. It was because we had connected and I tried to do, I, I don't want this to sound like self aggrandizing at all, but I, I wanted to do something for them, not really wanting them to be a, a de facto sales force for me. It was just a natural byproduct of being a friend and uh, I, I was able to, to check in and I was like completely honored the first year they have like this peer reviewed um, where the peers of these these groups vote on the the karma award. And I I'd spent so much time uh, trying to practice this that within a year I had won the, the karma award and this huge group of people who I just look up to that are just titans of industry um because i think they just saw so much of me <laughs> and it it just really created this that probably planted the seed where you know if if you go in with with this idea that you're going to get something out of a relationship and you people can see it from like 10 miles away you know, they, they, they know, they know the way you talk. They know the way you, that you kind of go about uh, interacting with them. And eventually that stuff, that's where relationships go to die. Uh, that's, that's the graveyard of relationships when you're constantly trying to figure out what can I get from somebody else. And the magic of life, I think, is losing yourself. Just like the Bible says, when you lose yourself, you'll find yourself. Uh, when you lose yourself in helping others, it always comes back in a way that benefits you. And that's not why you do it, but it's just a natural byproduct of, uh, of trying to, to go out of your way and, and not really having these ulterior motives of, and I need to sell something. Uh, my co-host uh, on the podcast, Corey, he, like we have like certain people that we both know. And he's like, ah, I don't know about like hanging out with him or spending time with him just because, Every time he talks to me, he wants to sell me something, you know, and that's not the reputation or the legacy that I feel like I want to leave for myself. So um, that's very kind of you to say I can always be better at it. But um, if you felt that from me, it's probably because over the last 12 years, that's how I've built my business. I, I think it's been incredible, um, and and I listened to it, and it reminds me of my buddy uh, Jim DiGiulio, right? And so Jim is actually one of the sponsors of the podcast. He owns uh, Finley Volvo of uh, Cars of Las Vegas, and he said to me one time, and I, I'll send you the the episode, but he said, "I look at relationship as opposed to transaction," and it's what I think about with you, but. 
Can you talk to that person out there that's in the struggle because they're like, Kirk, this sounds amazing. Like this sounds so good to me. Sounds fills up my soul, but Kirk, my pockets are empty right now and I need to make the sale. So I like what you're saying, but can you help them to, to, to realize or you know, what do you say to that person that wants to be like, pat you on the head, bless your heart, Kirk, I love you, but you're really successful, so it's really easy for you to say that. I'm in the struggle right now. I need money, so I need to be looking at the transactions. What do you say to them? I understand. <laughs> uh, when I started my business, I left, uh, I left a partnership. I had three kids and a newborn baby, a mortgage, a minivan, and $50,000 worth of debt from previous. That's the title of your book, man. That's the title <laughs> of your book. Three, three kids, a newborn, a minivan, $50,000 in debt. That's the, I mean, can you imagine like the minivan on the, uh, the cover <laughs> of the book and then Kirk and Karen standing uh, off to the side smiling? Go ahead. Keep going, man. Uh, I completely understand that that idea the, that you just expressed of saying, yeah, that's that's all fine and well, um, but I need to make the sale. I had two weeks to come up with enough money to make my mortgage. Um, I sold my I sold my motorcycles. Um, I sold. I had to win. I had to win a great a biggest loser contest in my family to pay my mortgage. Like we all put in a hundred bucks and I had to win that to make my mortgage payment that, that month. Um, so I am like a hundred percent right there knowing how you feel. Um, uh, I don't know that there's a shortcut. Um, I had faith. I think that's, uh, that's something that not a lot of people talk about. Um, I had the support of a spouse that, second to none she never and we actually have talked about this recently um she never doubted that i would provide for the family and i could feel that from her so as much stress as i had on my shoulders to go out and make a mortgage payment by selling a suit um i didn't feel the added pressure from an unsupportive spouse for which I am eternally grateful because I think if that would have been heaped on top of the pressure that I felt to financially provide for my family, it would have been overwhelming to the point that I would have, you know, I thought many times when I first started, I, I just need to go get a $17 an hour job at Home Depot on the weekends. Like this isn't working. Right. Um, so I don't know that there's a shortcut, but it sounds trite to say, but the way to make it happen is just to do more of it. You need to have FaceTime with more people. You need to seek out those groups of people. You need to, I never really checked into BNI, but like everybody knows what that is. But like, if you go to BNI and you're passing referrals instead of expecting referrals that day, when you go to breakfast, um, you will, exponentially increase the number of people who talk about you. And if you do that so much and repeatedly on a daily basis, like there were times that I did breakfast and lunch at networking events. And then I would go to dinner with like, I wasn't even eating at home, which is part of the reason that um, I'm sure we'll get into it, <laughs> that I developed the gentleman project because I was never home. And I came home at the end of the day and I was like, sorry, kids. Like I wasn't here at all. I'm just trying to provide for my family. And, um, so much of what I've tried to do in the last decade, um, stems from the combination of being able to, or the combination of being away from home and still feeling that pull, like I'm not doing enough. I, I just got to make a mortgage payment. So Short answer, do more of it. <laughs> so let's, let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit and because you started it. Um, so I'm going to blame it on you. 
want to give a shout out to my wife because the pinky ring came on our 10th anniversary too, by the way. Uh, Brooklyn, I love you. If you can't see it right now, um, you should. Because I, she asked me what I wanted in life, and I said she thought I was going to be all philosophical and stuff when we first started off in our marriage. And she was like, I want to, you know, love you for the rest of our lives and grow old together. And she's like, what do you want? And I said, a pinky ring. And she just started laughing. <laughs> she's like, you got problems. Uh, oh, but, man. But she listened. So, But let's go into this because... There's so many entrepreneurs, and we were just talking about this. I was just talking with a guy named Jason from Hotmart, and Hotmart is a phenomenal uh, place for um, uh, for digital courses and, and being able to get the information out there. But we were talking, and I said, there's so many entrepreneurs out there, and I, I was one of them. Until my brother told me this, I was like, I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for my family. And then my brother looked at me, he was like, uh-uh. He said, you're doing it for you. You're doing it for your own ego. Because if you were truly doing it for your family, then you would have built your fam or your business around your family as opposed to your uh, family around your business. And it hit me because at first I wanted to fight him and be like, no, I'm traveling and I'm doing all these things and I'm away from home and I'm not being at dinner because of my family. And he's like, no, nah, I don't take that. That's not true. Can you yeah. talk to the entrepreneurs out there that think that if I just go and I provide at a high level financially, someday I'm going to be able to spend time with my family. <laughs> oh, how much time do we have? Hey, man, we got all, I said <laughs> podcasts generally go six to seven hours. <laughs> so buckle up, baby. This, I love clothing, right? I love what I do for a living. But this is my passion that I could speak hours on. Um, and it, it, it really stems from my own personal experience, right? Um, so much of what we see in ourselves is an identity tied to what we do for a living. And when that can be ripped out from under us in a matter of minutes, right? And then as I think a lot of time as men and women as well, we tie our identity to what we, what we do to bring, bring bread home. And we go into this, we go into this mode of default and you've seen, you've seen this object lesson. We, I saw it in Sunday school once it's this big glass jar and it's got big rocks, medium sized rocks, little rocks and sand. Right. And if you fill up, um, all of the the bottom with the sand all the little stuff and you try to fit all these rocks in on top of it they never fit right but if you start with the big things the important things the big rocks and you put those in the bottom of the jar you can stack those little ones and they fill in the cracks and you'll find the time life is a lot like that because what happens is a lot of times we think those big rocks are i got to go to work i've got to feed my family i got to provide and when in reality, we, we go into a default mode where we have uh, no time left over for the things that are most important at the end of the day. And we fall asleep at night, mad at ourselves that we didn't do what mattered. Um, and to quote my good friend, Rob Schallenberger, who's been a huge proponent of the Gentleman Project, um, do what matters most and do that first. And so for me, um, I think designing like what you said, designing a business around a lifestyle, not a lifestyle around a business. And you've heard this before. Most people start a business. Um, and instead of running the business, the business runs them because they're constantly chasing the sale and they'll do anything to make the sale. Um, if I can, for a short moment, um, walk the people who are listening through my own personal journey of this, um, I see it only as the hand of God in my life that this happened. Um, but it was a blessing that I didn't see until years later. And I'm in the thick of this, right? And I still remember the conversation that I had with my wife one night laying in bed and I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the thick of like selling things I own to pay the mortgage and, um, 
trying to put on a good face that things were fine financially. And I felt like a horrible father because I was not home very much. And she looked at me and she said, I feel like I need to go back to school and get another degree. And I said, in what and with what money? Mm. And she said, I feel like I need to be a nurse and we'll figure it out. She already had her degrees. I thought we were done with college. Like we'd gone through that whole stage of life. And I learned, I learned something at the end of this is never ignore the promptings of a righteous wife. If she's feeling drawn to something uh, and feeling like she's being tapped on the shoulder by God to do something, you support her. And um, we've been married for 20 years. And I think that's been a big thing for us to, uh, to be able to, to make our marriage work is that we always feel like we have each other's back. But I said, so we had a, we had a little girl who would be like thrown into daycare because I was gone like five, six days a week, uh, working like 80 hours, 90 hours a week. And I said, Karen, I'm not going to put Paisley into preschool early and I'm not going to put her into daycare. So if you feel like you need to go back to school, I'm going to be a part part time stay at home dad. So we figured it out with her schedule. She started back and like she started like from scratch, like she's taking pathophysiology and chemistry at the kitchen table. Um, like she's incredibly intelligent. She aced all of her classes. I still don't know how she did it with four kids. Uh, but we figured it out with her schedule where I would be on the road on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And so I was paring down 90 hours a week to 24 to 36 hours a week. Wow. And I, I was like in the throes of not being able to make the money that I needed. And what it forced me to do was to look at who I was doing business with. And I said, if I can only spend this number of hours in front of my clients, I'm going to have to increase the average sale that I make with each client by two and a half to three times because I'm cutting in half the number of hours that I'm enabling myself to be in front of people. And so I worked it backwards. I did the math backwards and I developed my business model because I do high end custom. And this is why I do high end custom because I need to be compensated for time away from my family. And at that point I didn't have any more hours. So I changed my business model and I wrote a letter to my clients and I said, thank you for your business. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the level of service that I have provided to you in order to continue providing that level of service. I'm closing my book of business and I will only take new business from the top clients like you. And most people do this like 80, 20 rule, you know? So I went through and found out that mine wasn't 80, 20, it was 90, 10. So 10% of my clientele was accounting for 90% of my revenue. And I thought, why in the world would I try to duplicate the bottom 90% when I can du duplicate the top 10% and double my business? And that is exactly what happened. So I, I said, this is what I have to sell. This is who I have to sell it to. And I need to learn everything about that person. So imagine this, you know, like I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm a, I feel like I'm a failing father, a failing provider. I just closed my book of business to new business and I'm going to be selling to people who are completely outside of my socioeconomic platform. And I joined country clubs. I don't golf. I went to the racetrack. I had no car. Um, I, I hung out at these places that people had money and you know, the fake it till you make it like all of these cliches that I'm using. I, I had like imposter syndrome, big time. 
like I, I didn't feel like I was being authentic to my own self because I worked in a world I did not live in, you know? Um, but the more I was around these people and the more I invested in them and learned about them and learned about their lifestyle, um, the more they became true friends and the more they gave me repeat business. And so long story, but designing a business around what you want for your family life is a huge part of it so that your business doesn't run you, you run your business. And so I turn down more business than I accept. Um, and you said this before, um, I will interview you. Like if you go to my website, which please do, um, if you think I'm a good fit for you, but I changed all the language on my website and it's not call me. I want to sell you something like all of the traditional sales copy. I changed up my website to be like, I hope we're the right fit. We might not be, and that's okay. But this is, these are my, I'm upfront. Like these are my price ranges. This is what I do. This is what you can expect from me. Um, so schedule, a, schedule a phone call with me to see if we're the right fit. Usually at the end of a 10 minute phone call, I've given them about four or five reasons why I might not be the right fit. And if I am the right fit after those 10 minutes, then I know I've got somebody that's a qualified candidate that will be a relationship, not a transaction. And so I will flat out ask people, uh, are you interested in a relationship with a clothier? Um, or is this a one-time transaction for you? And that's fine if it is. I can refer you to somebody else if that's the case. But for me, this is, um, this is the way I run my business. Because it's not their business. It's my business. And I get to decide who I do business with and what I sell and who I sell it to. And because of that, it opened up time for me to be able to spend time with my daughter and my other kids. But I have a relationship with that youngest daughter now that is so sweet. And she still talks about those days of doing laundry on the bed. Uh, to Johnny Cash songs and Roger Miller songs. And she has this amazing memory. She can remember all of it. And I think I would have missed all that. I would have missed, I would have missed all of those memories. Um, my wife, you know, cruised through, I shouldn't say cruised through. She toughed out nursing school um, and is an amazing, uh, smart, caring nurse. Um, now, but, and, and that was a huge blessing, um, to us, um, that she followed that prompting. Um, so in short, yes, design your business and design your customer base, design the things that are most important to you first, put the big rocks in the bottom of the jar and then figure out how to fill in the rest of it. It'll happen. But most of the time we're living by default. So the little stuff goes in first out of necessity and it's it's those things that are just put in front of us that we just have to take care of and then at the end of the day we go didn't have time for the things that were most important kirk we're going to take a quick commercial break and then when we come back we're going to talk about the impacts that that has had on your family but also the freedom that it has given you to think on a completely different level the way I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. 
By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I want to help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time to get prepared. Kirk, that, uh, that actual uh, commercial is fitting because when I look at when I look at what you're talking about there um, with your family and choosing the wealth, right? And, and choosing the wealth, not because of the money aspect of it, but just what you were talking about is like, you know, you were looking at the fact of, you know, hey, I want to charge a, a higher premium because my time is valuable. I've got less of it. So I can end up spending time with my family. Um, did you see immediate because you talked about the, uh, you know, folding clothes and listening to Johnny Cash with your daughter. Did you see immediate success with that concept or was there a, a learning curve in what you were doing also? Uh, there was a learning curve, but it happened faster than I anticipated. Uh, at my average sale, my average margin um, was, was better because I was able to, I had, I just, I knew what I had to make and what I had to sell. And I just did the math and worked myself backwards. So um, that's, I would say I, I did the math uh, in 18 months, my average, my revenue uh, tripled, my monthly revenue tripled in 18 months. Hold on, say, say it again and say it slow. By choosing who I worked with and what I sold, in 18 months, my monthly revenue, my average monthly revenue tripled. Okay. Can you say it one more time? I think some people probably broke up or maybe some people couldn't hear you, but I want to say, say, say it again <laughs> and say it very slow and look into the camera as much as possible and say that again, Kurt. By choosing who I worked with and what I sold, I... Uh, was able to triple my average monthly revenue in 18 months. I went silent because I want people to think about that. And Kirk, you are such an example of doing the right thing for the right reasons and the right things turn out. Can you, and I'm going to do a little brag point here too, because I want people to understand the level of which you play at. So can, can you give us some, you know, the, the caliber of people that you're working with right now and that you've worked with in the past, because I think a lot of times when a person hears a humble spirit like you, and this is not something that Kirk leads with either. I have to draw this out of him. I like to brag about him. I have the coolest friends in the world. So help us to understand what, what, what does that client look like and who are some of the people that you've worked with in the past? Well, I can tell you what that client looks like, but my my client list is private. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not name dropping on the podcast. Um, that means, that means it's real good for those of you out there that are in business. And I think it's, I think it's honorable. I think it's amazing, but I could tell you, I mean, I'm not saying names, but I'm saying athletes at the highest level. I'm saying executives at the highest level. I'm saying owners and founders at the highest level. I mean, those are the people who, who seek, seek you out. Um, how much, uh, you know, what, how did this impact your marriage? Because we talked about like Paisley and Paisley has a meaning behind her name. We'll get to that here in a second. Um, but how did this affect you and Karen's relationship um, when you made this decision to, I'm going to repeat it, in 18 months, because he chose to wrap his business around his family, he was able to triple his income on a monthly basis. But, but continue on and tell us how it impacted you and Karen's relationship. Uh, I, I mean, we've got, I think a really unique, I feel like we have a unique relationship. Um, I feel like we we're kind of like spirit people. <laughs> um, like Karen, I, Karen gets me and I get Karen. Um, and I think if we look back, um, we just got back from a trip to Europe celebrating our 20 years. And, uh, 
we had this conversation and we talked about what were what were the things that were most meaningful to each other in our lives and one of the things that she said was um your support while i went back to school to be uh, a nurse and you know it's been years now since she finished and i that still sticks out to her as one of the things that she appreciates about our marriage um not only that you 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 ask a question about our marriage um it didn't do anything but strengthen it. Number one, was it easy? No, it was not. It was, it was difficult. We had family that helped, um, you know, when, when certain things came up, we had a very supportive family. Um, and, and Karen was, Karen took everything very seriously. She's a great manager of her own time. But what happened was this Kelly, uh, our kids were old enough to recognize their mother's effort in her school and how she was taking it seriously and how it wasn't easy. Um, her, her ability to still maintain the wheels on the bus um, while the bus is, uh, you know, flying off a cliff in flames in, in, <laughs> in her life, uh, the kids saw her manage that load and that stress. And if you asked my kids, how did your mother going back to school impact your life? They would say that they learned by example from their mother how to do hard things. And that was one of the most important lessons that I wanted to teach my kids. And so by helping my wife and supporting my wife through following that prompting, uh, my kids learned through four, four years uh, of watching their mother work herself through nursing school uh, to get another college degree when it, I mean, there was, there was nothing that was like, she had to do it. She just was following a prompting that she felt like God told her, that this was, this was something that she should do. And I will tell you this, Kelly, um, we've talked about this openly in my home. We didn't know the reason why. And we never really questioned the reason why. But in February of 2020, when the world shuts down and my income essentially disappears overnight, my wife's ability to have a job that she could work from home because she was off the floor at that point and my ability to know how to be a dad at home to support the kids through online school and and things like that we looked at each other and we spoke about it openly in our family this is why because without mom's expertise in the nursing industry and without that diversification i would be you know looking for another job during that time uh, luckily my overheads and things were such that i could kind of go into i call it hibernation mode and i can come out of hibernation anytime i want uh, but there for a good year there was not a whole lot happening because as long as you had uh, a button up shirt and a pair of boxers. You could do a zoom call from home and, uh, and pretty much make it work. Nobody was traveling. I work with a lot of people that make their living from stage, speaking, singing, performing. None of that was happening. So, uh, it was the kind of like the perfect storm, but my wife was the, the, the raft that came and saved us. So we know now why God told her to do that because it's taught our family amazing lessons and, it kept our family in the place where my kids could stay in the same schools. We didn't lose our house. You know, we, we had some savings and, and things like that. So that's, uh, that's the blessing that it had on our marriage and our family. I hear you uh, bringing up a word that is a three letter word that a lot of people think is a four letter word in business. And uh, it, it's God. And you, you keep, you, you know, you refer to that, but it's amazing because like when I'm around you, it's not overbearing. 
it's not a situation where you're thumping someone upside the head. Um, but my, my pop taught me that 99% of challenges in, in business and in life and in relationships um, is cultural, right? Is the culture of the family. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people are listening and they're like, wow, he's got this supportive wife. You know, he's got these amazing children. I mean, we know that you put in the work for it. Can you take us back to early young Kirk? Like when were these principles put in line and how were they? Um, was it by you seeing it? Was it by you hearing it? Because I find a lot of people um, find themselves in relationships that maybe aren't building them up. When, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the studies today is, you know, it's the 31st of uh, January and Proverbs 31. And you're describing, every time you describe your wife, you're describing a Proverbs 31 woman. But where did little Kirk learn these principles to be able to create the type of culture that you have in your family and attract the type of wife that you have? (laughs) That's a really good question. Uh, I knew from a young age that I wanted a wife that loved children. Uh, I was attracted to that type of a girl um, from a, a young age. Like I remember the, the crushes that I had were all babysitters. <laughs> um, I loved I loved the thought of uh, of a, a woman playing uh, playing a, a traditional role in a family, but not as a secondary citizen or a, a sub, submissive wife. But as you know, in this in the scriptures, it says that it, when you yoke yourself to God, your burdens will become light. And I feel like a marriage is a combination of a relationship with your wife or your husband. And when you yoke yourself as a couple to God, then he makes the things that normally couples find extremely difficult to fight through they have a different perspective on what life means and if they're pulling in that same direction like an ox pulls with another ox on a yoke they can pull through fields that are hard and the plow will keep moving and god will help make that happen so i think a shared vision of what you want if I had married uh, a woman that I didn't share the same values with, I think it would be difficult to get through some of the things that marriages see. Um, and not not saying that uh, I, I couldn't have made it work, but I, I have been extremely blessed in my life to have a woman that is supportive, that helps drive the family. Um, she is the glue behind our family. Our kids know it. Um, our traditions are supported by her. Um, she comes up with new traditions that keep our family strong. Um, she makes sure that everyone feels welcome and secure in our home. And to see teenagers, I have four of them now. Well, I have three and a tween. But to see how my 15-year-old sons respect their mother and talk about how wonderful she is um, behind her back, not just to her face, um, makes me extremely proud of the woman that she is. Kirk, when have you messed up as a husband? Because you've been married 20 years. And I think my brother told me this and, uh, and <laughs> is that most people will learn from our failures more than they'll learn from our successes. So when you look at a Kirk who is, one of the premier in the custom clothes, uh, clothes business throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, he also is the host of the number one rated podcast, uh, the Gentleman Project podcast. Um, so when we look at that, we're like, wow, Kirk, you know, st- went to the country club when he wasn't even golfing to be able to meet people who golfed. This is the man. He's a scrapper. He's getting it done. But sometimes people count themselves out when they hear that because they're like, damn, Kirk is like a superhero. And he is. I know him, guys. I know him as a friend. This is an absolute superhero. But where have the challenges been for you? (laughs) 
Wow. Uh, you said nothing was off limits. Uh, professionally, I, I needed that, that moment uh, of clarity when my wife said, hey, you don't have as many hours anymore. That was a huge blessing because I was focused way too much on my business and building something that I felt like if I fail at this, I fail as a man. And I, I neglected the things that were most important um, and was not being purposeful as a husband or a father. Um, and that's the genesis of the gentleman project. And hold on, Kurt, Kurt, hold on for a second. <clears throat> a person listening right now, hearing you say that, I mean, number one, I want to thank you for it and being vulnerable, but tell us how you weren't like, were, were you, were you not, were, I mean, were you just not around? Was there things that you were doing that was silly that, you know, because again, I, I think that, you know, the people, and when I say the people, it's me. I'm curious. I'm curious about my buddy because I see you as this straight superhero, like this, you know, bulletproof dude that's like, you know, doing the right thing in business for no transactions, just relationships, doing the right thing, uh, tripling your business, being a, a great father, being a great husband. Like, explain it to us because I think some people don't, almost can't compute that. Well, this will make me, I mean, you keep using the word superhero and you're, um, I think you're giving me a lot of credit, Kelly. Um, but I'm going to describe a day that is probably familiar to 90% of the people listening to the podcast. Um, you get up in the morning and you do the things that you need to do to get out the door. You spend the day at work. You come home. You're lucky if you have dinner with the family, if they haven't already eaten before you got there. You're so exhausted by the time you get home that all you want to do is just sit down and chill and have some alone time or me time to sit on the couch and watch a game or uh, do something that, that fills you up. And there was no design in my life. There was no system in my life to put the big rocks in first. So the big rocks never even got touched at that point. And I don't know, I don't know anybody that probably hasn't felt this way that when they're laying in bed at night, they say, well, same stuff tomorrow, you know, same stuff, different day. And kind of just feeling like you're in a hamster wheel and not going anywhere. Um, that's really how, that's really how I felt. Um, and I'd look over and I'd see these beautiful children that were five, six, seven, and one and I would want to spend time with them. I just didn't know what to do with them because I was exhausted. And I'd have 10 or 15 minutes. And I'd say, you know, I love you. Like, I, I never went out and, like, fooled around on my wife. I never went out and, you know, gambled away my earnings. I never went to the bar. Like, I was doing – I was living, like – I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't doing anything right either. And if, if we can, this is really where the, the beginning of the gentleman project story starts because I was, I was there like at night going, what legacy am I going to leave my kids if I have 10 minutes a day with them and I can't even bring up a conversation, they're growing up without my influence and I live in their home. And I knew that there had been mentors in my life that I looked up to, that I hoped that I was going to be able to some 
how someday teach these principles to these children. But in the position that I found myself in, exhausted at the end of an 80 or 90 hour a week, I had no system in place to teach them anything. Uh, we'd go to church together on Sundays and, um, you know, lucky if we got to spend some time together on Saturday, but during the week, I may as well lived somewhere else. That's the way I felt. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that my kids necessarily felt like I was an absent dad, but they didn't know any different. They just knew dad works. He's gone a lot. And when he comes home, I go to bed. And for these little kids, I felt like that was not really the, that's not what I wanted them to remember about me. I asked dads all the time, you know, what, what did you learn from your dad or what do you hope your kids learn from you? And I'm not saying that this is the wrong answer, but the number one answer I get from people is hard work. Hard work is an enormously important principle to be successful in life. But if that's the first and only thing that you can think of, your life is out of balance. And there needs to be a little bit more design and purpose put into your interpersonal relationships with the people and the things that mean the most to you. And that's really what I hope my work with the gentleman project helps people realize is it does not take a seismic shift in habits and systems to be a better dad. It does not take an earthquake. It takes one small decision put into a regular routine that makes your family realize that you are acting on purpose to be a part of their life. That's it. And so on the podcast, we often talk about the things that people are doing inside their homes that are successful. Well, if you only took one of those things, just one thing, and implemented it in your life all the way, 100%, uh, you would see a, a dramatic shift in your relationships at home. So... Kirk, how does a person take it from their hands, transfer it to their head, and get it in their heart? The reason why I say this is because when you listen to podcasts or you listen to, you read books or whatever it is, they're always telling you things to do with your hands. They're telling you the systematic way to be able to make your a marriage better. But, I, but I've watched this all the time. A person will be like, yo, you need to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and dominate your morning, okay? It's with your hands. You're going to wake up with your hands. You're going to be moving. You're going to do that stuff. Until it gets into your head and it becomes a mindset, right, then it's not going to, I mean, you're only going to do it for as long as until you're tired. But that mindset will only last until you get to a place where, it gets in your heart. Like the heart set is where it's all at, right? And I look at you and you have a heart set of being a better father, of being a better husband. How do you take it from hands to head to heart? Because that's where it's going to be sustainable. So uh, I think you have to allow yourself to ask a question of yourself. And many of us don't do that we don't allow ourselves to ask a question. And that question might be, what legacy do I leave? Uh, what's my purpose? What's most important to me? What's out of balance in my life? What, does, what do I spend the most time on? Uh, where, do I place, where do I place the most importance in my life? And you can tell that by where you spend the most time. But it starts by asking yourself a question. And you have to allow yourself to ask that question, number one. And then you also have to allow yourself and others to give you feedback on that question. And 
then you have to make changes based on the observed behavior in your relationships. And what I mean by that is if you've allow yourself to ask a question and you've, you say, okay, let's, let's work through this. My family is the most important to me over business hundred times, right? So how do I show my family? This is my, this would be a question. How do I show my family that I care about them? And then you can ask your wife because you're allowing yourself not only to ask a question of yourself, but you are allowing yourself to ask a question of your wife and listen. Because if you ask a question and you don't listen, you didn't ask the right question. Mm. So if she says, yeah, um, I could use your help a little bit more um, at night when you get home. And instead of saying, but when I get home, I'm exhausted and I just need some time for myself. What's wrong with that? You allow yourself to absorb her feedback. Right. And then, so you've allowed yourself, number one, to ask yourself a question. Then you've opened that question up to others and you're listening for their feedback. And then you make changes based on the observations of yourself and others. And maybe that's clearing your plate after dinner instead of waiting for her to do it. Maybe that's sitting down and doing whatever your kids are doing at night instead of, hey, do you want to do something together? Yeah, what do you want to do? Well, let's do something I want to do. Go to where your kids are, right? And sit down with them and let them know that you just want to be there. Um, one of the things that I started at the beginning of this year, it, so it's been 31 days, um, this is my current project with my kids. I told them, uh, because my youngest got a phone where she can receive texts now. So I'm going to where my kids are, Kelly. My kids are interested in that mobile device. And as much as I hate them and as much as I, <laughs> I, I held off in like giving them a smartphone, I also need the time to teach them how to use that technology properly before they leave my house. So I'm trying to go to where they are and I can reach them if I send them a text. So I told them at the beginning of the year, um, I want to be a better dad and I want to tell you some of the things that I learn as I'm working and as I'm doing the podcast and, um, just my thoughts throughout the day. So once a day, I send them a text and it, we have a family group thread. It's not an individual text. Uh, it's just trying to be where my kids are. And I purposely throughout the day, I'm trying to figure out something that I want to teach them. And yesterday it was while I was editing a podcast, one of the things that I learned from the podcast guest um, the day before that, it was something that I heard at church. Um, and I'm sending them a text. It's usually about like a small paragraph. And then every once in a while, it'll just be like pretty lighthearted, like a dad joke or something. Right. I don't care so much that they read it. I care that they know that I took the time to write it. And if they see consistency from me as their dad asking, what I'm really doing is I'm asking them to be a part of their life mm -hmm. because I felt myself becoming more distant because they're so busy. There's sports and work and school and friends. And now I'm number five on that list. And I really kind of felt like I was back in the beginning days, right? when I wasn't being purposeful and designing my relationship with my kids. So that's my current thing. I'm trying to go to where my kids are because I asked myself the question, um, what are you doing to impact your children and teach them actively right now? And I couldn't answer that question in a way that, that was uh, 
that satiated that the the desire to be more involved right so uh i talked to my wife about it so i i asked myself the question and then i asked my wife about it and i told my wife what i was going to do and then we sat down i think it was on new year's day and i just said hey guys like we're all so busy we're all running different directions it's really nice when we can have a family dinner at home but it's happening less and less um because of work school and sports so I'm going to send you something every day. Um, I hope you read it. Um, I just want you to know that I love you and that I'm thinking about you during the day. And uh, so that's that's really how I think you take these the the idea you know, of being a more purposeful father, or better father, or good dad, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's a tactile thing, but that tactile thing it didn't go from hands to head to heart it came from heart to head to hands right it went the other direction um, because i allowed myself to ask myself a question receive feedback from others and then um, act on the feedback that i received in an honest way and not a defense the defensive way so I love it how you try and deny that you're a superhero, but every single person when you and when they hear you speak, I mean the 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 comments section is going nuts um, right now. But I I want to I want to thank you for that. I'm going to ask you a question, but then we're going to take a commercial break while you think about the question before you answer it, right? Give so me a good one. <laughs> every single time, every single time that, uh, um, well, the the majority of times, people go this way. They go super hard charging early on in their life. Um, they get to a point where they realize that money is enough and then they start to lock into the purposeful part of life. But then there are those who have locked into the purposeful part of life. They start going towards that and then they apply the same principles and strategies that they did going after their business and they systemize the, their relationships as opposed to living in them. And I want to ask how you've been able to not do that because you seem to understand how to be able to tow that line. On that, we're going to a commercial break and we'll be right back with Kirk's amazing superhero answer. <laughs> so they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. So we're back with, with Kirk. Kirk, it looked like you were writing down some answers there. Um, <laughs> Help, help us on this because, again, I find that um, people will have the tendency to um, apply the exact same principles just to another thing. And I'll give you an example of it. I have friends who have been addicted to alcohol, have stepped away from alcohol, said, I'm going to work out in place of alcohol. And then they get addicted to working out and their relationships suffer because of them working out so much at the gym as opposed it, 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 it ends up being almost exactly the same, but you have seemed to find, find the Holy grail with it. And how, how is that? Let us in on your secrets and then can you uh, write them down and then send them out to all of us. So all of us can be superheroes like Kirk Chuck. <laughs> oh man, you really know how to make me uncomfortable. <laughs> You said that nothing was off limits, man. No, it's the, the I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time with the superhero thing. So um, I think that life is made up of patterns, right? And sometimes we, we fall into like, yeah, I'm, I have an addictive personality or 
you know, and they kind of use that as a crutch for becoming addicted to something else. Um, and, and I'm not a psychologist. I probably need psychologists. <laughs> um, I think we all do, I, man. I think a therapist is a really good thing. Um, I, I, when you said I was writing something down, I, uh, I, I attend a, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, it's not a networking group. Um, I would call it more of like a men's group um, of kind of like-minded, um, like-aged, uh, like belief system uh, men that we meet once a month. And this was shared um, by one of one of those guys this last uh, this last month. And it's a quote by Brene Brown. Um, like her or hate her, I think she's I think she's uh, got some amazing things to say. Um, and I felt like this applied to me because you talked about that journey through life where you were, you know, hustling and grinding and and then you have some semblance of success and then you take what worked in business and then you try to apply it to life, right? Um, and I would say in the last 12 months that I have felt like a midlife crisis, right? Like I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling older than I ever have. <laughs> Things don't heal as quickly. Did uh, you buy a, did you, you buy know? a Corvette too? Did you buy a Corvette? I bought an AC Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is true. It is true. Uh, you're gonna buy a two. Crisis. You're gonna buy a two seater, two door. Uh, you know, yeah. you know. Did you get some gold chains too? Did you get the the gold chain no. with the horn? The horn that we used leaving, to get from I'm Avon. Leaving, I'm leaving all the chains to you, Kelly. Okay. Um, but this really spoke to me. Um, it's a it's a little bit of a longer quote, so hang with me here. I think midlife is when the universe gently places her hands upon your shoulders, pulls you close and whispers in your ear. I'm not screwing around here. It's time. All of this pretending and performing these coping mechanisms that have developed to protect yourself from feeling inadequate and getting hurt has to go. Your armor is preventing you from growing into your gifts. I understand that you need these protections when you were small. And I understand that you believed your armor could help you secure all the things that you needed to feel worthy of love and belonging, but you're still searching and you're more lost than ever. Time is growing short. There are unexplored adventures ahead of you. You can't live the rest of your life worried about what other people think. You were born worthy of love and belonging. Courage and daring are, cor are coursing through you. You were made to live and love with your whole heart. It's time to show up and be seen. Bang, and, bang. <laughs> um, that really spoke to me. He read that out loud, and I think half of us in the room kind of had tears in our eyes because it, it felt like it, uh, it applied to us. So I, I've been thinking a lot about like my own mortality. Um, and here's my vulnerable moment, right? I, I buy a little two-seater, uh, and I ran it into a concrete barrier and uh just about died uh in october and as i'm spinning on the freeway waiting for a truck to plow into me broadside going 75 miles an hour um the only thought that i could have in my head was my family um, it was, what did I say to my kids the last time I saw them? Uh, did they know how much I love them? Does my wife know how much she means to me? And as quick and as fleeting as those thoughts were, that's what first popped into my head. So feeling my own mortality lately, because that experience, um, and the injuries that resulted from that are not healing the way they used to. Um, the, the practice of uh, writing your own obituary, you ever tried that? 
um, I, I lost my, I lost my grandfather, uh, about two weeks ago and my, my sister asked me to write something, uh, that I learned from my grandfather. And as I made a list of things that I learned from him, I thought this will be me someday. What do I want my grandson to write about me? What legacy do I want to leave? And what type of a dad, what type of a husband and what type of a friend do I want to have been? And so for me, that's, uh, that's been what I've been working through. And I don't know, um, what your demographic of the podcast is, what the average age is. Um, but I think you've got some pretty successful people that listen to your podcast, um, because your mastermind group on Facebook is absolutely chock full of, uh, <laughs> superstars. Um, and if they, if they identify with, with that, I think that's a, a wonderful exercise to try. Um, uh, writing your own obituary or um, one that I learned from my friend Scott O'Neill that was on the podcast. Um, he, he did an exercise uh, with his daughter that if he only had an hour with her, um, what would he tell her and what would she tell him? Um, amazing exercise, right? Like what would you download? What would you download to your loved ones if you knew you only had an hour left? And why aren't you saying those things right now? Kirk, let me ask you this. If you, if you only had three things that you could say to them and then you expired, what would they be? Um, for me, it would be that um, I love them unconditionally, which means without conditions, there's nothing that they could do that would make me love them any less. Um, that I love their mother mm. and that I hope they make a positive difference in life and that others feel joy through their association with them. Kirk, as we talk about, it, like, I think it's cool because you always refer to like the journey. Whenever I say you're a superhero, you defend it and you're like, no, that's not, I don't feel comfortable with that, all the stuff. Um, and I, I believe you are in your family, uh, you know, uh, hearing you talk about your wife, the pictures with your wife, the smile, the, you know, celebrating 20 years, uh, you know, you guys going over to Europe and not inviting a brother like you didn't invite me. I, I, I understand. But you took some other friends there. So I got to work up on the friend chart with you. Um, Let's but, go. But with with all with all this and, you know, talking about loving your fa family, loving your kids, all this stuff. What does your wife not hear enough from you? Um, she appreciates the little things and we, we've just recently talked about these things. Um, and before I answer that question, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how we got there. Um, I believe that we have, we have to ask ourselves, uh, the question, right? Like I talked about. A few minutes ago the question to our spouse is what do you need and what do you want and then you add for me right what do you need from me and then you shut up <laughs> that's the hard part for husbands uh, if you will ask your wife what do you need from me and in, in an environment that there's no judgment, there's no wrong answers, right? And there's no defensiveness. When you can ask that question and say, what do you need from me? Um, call it your love language or whatever else it is. It could be their love language and it could be something completely different. Um, my wife said, I like it when you tell me I look nice. Uh, I like it when I cook dinner that 
the family sticks around until the kitchen's clean. Mm-hmm. It's little stuff, right? Um, it's a text in the middle of the day. Um, and it's expressing appreciation for the things that she does every day. Like, I appreciate you folding and putting away the laundry. <laughs> That's what she doesn't hear enough from me. And I know that because we just had this conversation and it's taken 20 years for us to ask a simple question. Like, what do you need from me? Um, so great question. Um, because I know exactly what my (laughs) wife needs from me now because I asked her, (laughs) I know what she doesn't hear enough from me because I asked her. And it sounds so stupid and trite and simple, but we haven't put ourselves in a place before where I could say, okay, we're working on us right now. What can I do to be a better husband to you? And then just shut up and listen Mm -hmm. and don't say anything. Don't, don't, don't talk over her answer. And then just hear what she says. And if you'll do what she says, if she's being honest, it will improve your relationship. It's that simple, huh, Kirk? Man, like, man, I want to guarantee, I want to, hey, I want a 90 day (laughs) guarantee on this Kirk stuff. Like, I'm I'm going to come to my, I'm going to come to my wife and be like, look, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. You tell me that I'm going to do it and you better be happy when we're done. Because Kirk said (laughs) that it was guaranteed after 90 days. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or your money back. I think one of the, the most important things too, man, is, um, and what I heard with you is it seems like you're building your wife up uh, tremendously. I heard a couple of things. Number one, I heard you were in a men's group, which I think is super important for any of you out there that are listening. Get in a men's group. Also, if you're a woman out there, get in a woman's group. It could change everything. It really changed my life. Um, we in our men's group this morning. We were we were actually uh, studying Proverbs 31, which is a, uh, my mom was big on this because she said I need a Proverbs 31 woman in my life because I believe that she just wanted that woman to come in and whoop me into shape is what it was. But. I heard this in you and it's amazing because you kept complimenting your wife on so many other things. And then an hour and 17 minutes into this episode, you complimented your wife for the first time on how she looked is what you said. Like, if you go back and listen, you weren't like, oh, my wife is hot, super hot. She's blah, 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 blah. You were talking about all the virtues. And this was the things that, that I heard. Right. Uh, This is the things I heard in our men's group this morning. Compliment your woman on her confidence, her value, her hard work, her perseverance, her intelligence, her ingenuity, her wisdom, her prudence, her honor, and then bring the knockout punch of how hot she is. But if you lead with how hot she is, you won't set the foundation for the relationship and you have embodied that. Where did you learn that, Kirk? Oh, I'm learning that right now, Kelly. I've been married for 20 years and uh, that, that you just taught me, right? Um, I just think it's being, being allowed to have the conversation of you're not perfect and neither am I. How can we make this better? Right? Um, I, I don't, I do not have the husband father thing completely figured out. Um, I, I, I do have, um, wonderful examples in my life. If you ask where I've learned it from, I'll tell you, uh, my grandparents on both sides of my family are truly madly deeply in love. Mm. And both of them have been married for, uh, so I just lost my grandfather and I lost my grandmother in 2018. I don't know that I've ever seen two people more in love with each other in my life. Um, and then on my maternal side, I have both of my grandparents and they are so complimentary of each other. I listen to my grandfather talk about my grandmother and he talks about how wonderful of a partner she has been, the things that she's made possible for the family, the way she helped raise the children, the hard work she put in to, to building a household. Um, and he talks about it, not 
like you're going to hear this from me once. He talks about it almost every time I see him. Mm. And he doesn't do it behind her back. He does it in front of her. He does both, actually. Uh, but he'll say it right in front of her to whoever's willing to listen. He'll say, I, I do not think in – in all of my searching, if I had spent my whole life searching for a better companion, I would have never found somebody as good as your grandma. And so I've had wonderful examples of like this enduring love of like decades, like 50, 60, almost 70 years. My grandma and grandpa Chug were married for uh, almost 68 years. And they were as in love at the end of their lives as they were when they first met each other. Wow. And I have a recording of my grandpa talking about the first time he ever laid eyes on my grandma. He cannot tell that story without getting emotional. He talks about the first time he ever saw her walk into Sunday school. And I, I, I heard it like dozens of times. And one time I took my phone out and I recorded it. And it was on one of their wedding anniversaries sitting in their kitchen. And my grandma is over here, you know, like throwing in details, you know, uh, little, little details <laughs> here and there, like they, like they do after being married for 68 years. And the rest of the family is gathered in this little tiny kitchen listening to grandpa. And he starts to cry as he talks about how he felt when he first saw her. So if you ask me, like, if I have any, like, small – uh, uh, ability or success or like hereditary gene of uh, loving my wife the way that my grandparents uh, loved each other uh, it, it is amazing. And that's trickled down, you know, through my parents and um, through, through my wife's parents. Like we've just had amazing, uh, amazing family come before us that have really set a great example and a high bar for um, just valuing and cherishing your spouse. So, Kirk, what about the person out there that is listening to it and is like, wow, again, like Craig's a, or Kirk is a straight superhero, right? He got, I mean, he's not only a superhero, like working on the Gentleman Project podcast, you know, uh, tripling his business because he put his family first, all these things, but he's got a lineage of it. And they're, they're, they're counting themselves out right now because they're like, well, damn, like I didn't grow up with my dad. I didn't grow up with my mom. Um, my parents were divorced. My parents didn't like each other. They were fighting all the time. Where does a person start to create a generational impact like your grandparents had on you? Well, I believe there's two ways to, to learn. It's from people that you want to emulate and people you don't want to be like. And either way, there's a learning opportunity. And so take whatever lot that you have whatever lot you've been dealt and then realize like that quote said, you're in charge here and you can be the, the generational uh, chain breaker. If you come from a line of abusers, if you come from a line of, uh, of people who shirked responsibility, then take that and say, I'm the last one in this line of my family name that's going to act that way. I am not going to act that way, and I'm not passing that on to the next generation. I refuse to do so. So, I th I think you can learn. I think you can learn from from both ways. I, you're you're 100 correct. I feel like I have been blessed immensely by good examples in my life that I can emulate. If you didn't have that, you you know things I don't. And you have advantages I don't have because you've, you've seen things I've never seen. And you have the, the ability to move away from that as quickly as you want to. As many scars as there might be, it's a mindset. And like you, I love what you use. That's a heart set. You've got to have the heart set that you're the last one that's going to do that. It could be, you know, uh, abuse, alcoholism, uh, abuse of all kinds. Um, 
decide you're the last one that's going to that's going to pass that on. You're not going to be the next one to pass it on. So let's talk about hard conversations with kids because you have teenagers and I'll tell you quick, two quick stories about my, uh, my kids. One where I failed miserably the other day. Um, little son Maddox, who you guys know, uh, if you're listening, you, you know, him He is the joy of my, of my world. This kid is on fire. Uh, he got some new lightning force, uh, some Jordan force for all my sneaker heads out there. He got some uh, lightning force and they're, they're yellow and they look crispy. He wore them to school, came home and they were all dirty up and he looked at me and he was kind of down about his shoes and he said daddy uh you know my shoes got dirty today i said how'd your shoes get dirty son because i was thinking he's 11 he's gonna get them dirty he's like some people stepped on him and then he got really almost sad and he's like on purpose and the dad in me like i'm a god-fearing man i love my wife i love my family like to think that i would do the right thing but I went to a place where I didn't, I mean, where I don't like to live in my mind and in my heart. And so I went from my heart set <laughs> to my mindset and I said, ball up those fists and we're going into a, a skill set. And I said, the next time somebody, I said, son, the next time that somebody stomps on your shoes on purpose, if you want to ball up your fist and place it in their mouth, I don't have a problem. I will deal with the principal. I'll deal with whatever. And my son at 11 years old, said daddy that's not who I am wow he said that's not who I am and I don't want to overreact over small things that don't really mean anything <laughs> Kirk when's the last time that you screwed up as a dad and you wanted to place you wanted to tell your kid to ball up that fist and plant it in somebody's mouth like I, I just this just happened the other day or are you continuing to be a superhero? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> there was a slight delay there. I didn't get the joke until I started. Sorry. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of a history because I was quite the, I was a yeller um, when my kids were little. Um, when they didn't listen the volume just got louder and if they didn't listen after that they just got louder and i've got a really strong voice if i want to get mad and i want to turn the the volume up i can go from a talking voice to ear piercing um in no time and there's a couple things i have short fuses on um one is lack of respect for other people and the top one is lack of respect for their mother. I can't, I have a very, very hard time tolerating any type of lack of respect um, from my kids to their mom. And my fuse is almost non-existent. Um, when, when my kids are mean to each other, I recognize they're going to be mean to each other. But if my boys are mean to their sisters in a way that, uh demeans them or makes them feel insecure um also super shoot short fuse um i was getting a little bit of that the other night and well when the gentleman project started like back 2000 and uh 15 16 up to that point uh, my my disciplinary style was yelling and in if any of those things happened i was like zero to a hundred super fast and the other night i had kids um just just poking at each other just for the sake of poking at each other like there was no rhyme reason purpose behind being mean to each other it was just for the sake of being mean and I just, I don't know, I just hate that so much. <laughs> and I said, hey, knock it off. And they didn't knock it off. And I got a little bit louder. And they didn't knock it off. And so I went to level 10. And I went to level 10 for about five seconds. 
And my daughter, who's 17 and a half, was downstairs and she came upstairs and she was like, what just happened up here? Um, she said, I haven't heard dad yell like that for a long time. And I think, um, I think that's a good and a bad thing, right? Because I failed. I, there was, there was a better way to handle it. <laughs> Ironically enough, it did stop the bickering. <laughs> Uh, but the fact that my, that my daughter recognized that she hadn't heard my voice like that for a long time, um, told me that I'd messed up, that I'd fallen off the bandwagon. Um, so that's a good and a bad thing, I guess. So Kirk, what about the, the tough, uh, conversation? My daughter, uh, is 14 now. I picked her up from her friend's house the other day. And she had stayed the night and, you know, around 14, kids start sneaking out, uh, you know, things start to happen. My mom was pregnant at 15 because she lived in Utah. Um, all my Utah people out there, shout out to you. Because uh, some people are like, why did she wait so long? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke I can say because my family's from Utah. But... Um, and because I own the podcast uh, outright. <laughs> so um, the the other thing is, is like when I picked her up at 14 years old, I had the conversation with her and we have a really open relationship. I just asked her, I said, you know, hey, baby, like, um, you know, are your friends drinking? Um, you know, are your friends drinking right now? Like, are you, are they, is that happening? And she was like, some kids are not really the crew that I hang with. And I said, cool. And I said, how about like smoking or doing drugs? And she's like, well, you know, it's starting to come around, but I just don't hang out with people like that. And I said, well, what are you going to do when you're posed with it? And she was like, uh, I, don't, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. And, you know, I don't really think that it's something that I want to do. And I was like, wow, okay, that's, that's cool to talk about. And I said, how about the boys? You know, I mean, what about when you want to, like, because kids are going to start to sneak out. And she's like, dad, if I'm going to sneak out, I'll probably let you know before I do. And it warmed my heart, although it scared me because I was like, wow, she's thinking about sneaking out. Like, how do you bridge that with your daughter? Because at 17 years old, I mean, in Utah, um, Utah is a hotbed. Um, you know, Utah is a hotbed for, you know, for alcohol stuff, for, you know, for recreational drugs, for prescription drugs, things like that. How do you bridge that conversation with your teenagers to not be this domineering father, but to be able to make sure that they're making the right decisions? I think I lost you there for a second. Um, I, I think we lost uh, Kirk for a second. No, we lost your audio. Um, we love you. And what I'm thinking is, is that you're saying that, um, Kelly, you're the wisest guy that I know. And I would much rather hear your answers. I'm joking with you, but I, uh, we, we lost Craig, uh, Kirk's audio just for a, uh, for a second. Actually, uh, Kirk, if you drop off of the call and then you come back on, I'll bring you back on and it, it will. But for those of you out there listening, um, you know, these conversations I think are so important to have with your children because when your children are having the, um, the, the challenges, they need to be able to have a safe space to be able to talk to you about it. And I was just asking Kirk that, that question, like how's he bridging those conversations with his daughter? She's 17. He's got older, uh, older sons, but you know, let's see if your, your audio is back with us. No, our audio is not there with us uh, right now, and that's completely good. Um, but bridging those kind of uh, of those kind of conversations are probably the the most important. Um, you know, I've failed a ton um, in my uh, in my time. I've failed uh, hugely because even with that conversation with my son Maddox that I had the other day, I thought that. You know, here's a uh, here's a young man that I'm going to teach him a lesson about being a man, and what I what I found was that he uh, that wasn't his character, 
And it was amazing for me because of that, that point. Um, Kirk, can we, uh, can we hear your audio? We lost you still. So we might want to drop out one more time and then come back in um, to see if we can catch uh, his audio. Um, we'll check and see if, uh, if he can. But like I was talking about before with my son, I had an experience with him playing football. And, uh, you know, he was playing football and the kid swung at him. And then I was just mad. And I was like, you know, well, you need to take this kid basically take him out. And, uh, you know, it was a lesson that my dad taught me, you know, and I wasn't a fighter and my son, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to raise my son as a fighter. And I got a, a conversation with my brother and he said, Kel, like, you got to understand that that's not the type of kid that you raised. And that's not the type of kid that you want to have in your house either, because you don't want him dealing from rage you know, maybe you did when you were a kid. And again, I wasn't a fighter in that scenario. Um, but you want to raise a kid that is working with his mind. And that's something that you should celebrate. And, um, you know, for us as fathers, um, I think it's probably one of the most important things that you can do is to be able to connect with your kids, um, you know, and be able to have those type of conversations and, and bridge those kind of conversations. Uh, I believe we have Kirk back. Can we hear you now, Kirk? Mr. Kirk, can we hear you now? This is the fun part of live TV because with live TV, you run the risk of little things like this. I'm going to drop you out, Kirk. Um, I'm going to drop him out. He's working on his audio, but um, you guys can see that this, this young man is an absolute superhero. Um, and I want to thank every single one of you for, uh, for joining the podcast. We're going to try it one more time. And uh, can you hear us there, Kirk? Hey, Kelly, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear you though. Okay. So let me see here. Um, so what I'm going to, what I'm going to say, uh, here is I, I want to thank Kirk. This, this man is absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to ask him for another, uh, for another podcast and for him to come on in the future, which I think will be absolutely phenomenal. Um, he has been a, a, an absolute pleasure to be on the show and, um, to learn about who he is, who he is as a person, who he is as a father, who he is as a businessman. And uh, what I would love for you to do is to be able to share this episode with every single person that you possibly can. Um, you know, I, I want you to uh, thank our sponsors. We will try one more time to bring this young man on. Kirk, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can. I can hear you now. I, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I'm cool. Not sure. I was, I was just about to go to the sponsor part of it because I wanted to thank them, but it's good to be able to have you back. Um, <laughs> I do want to shout out a sponsor really quick because um, Volvo, uh, Finley Volvo Cars of Las Vegas is, 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 has been a sponsor since the very beginning. And the reason why, like all of our sponsors, they're all people who I believe in their companies. And um, Jim DiGiulio was a person who was, has been doing the top level service in the car industry before it was even the thing. He was delivering cars before that was a thing. Uh, in 2000 and uh, late 2014, early 2015, he delivered my car from Las Vegas to Carlsbad because I called him. That's a, a level of service that you generally do not get. And it's Finley Volvo Cars of uh, Las Vegas. Um, so uh, you can check that out in the, um, in the comments. So help me with this, Kirk, because before we lost you, and I want to thank every single one of us, uh, you guys riding with us, because live things like this, they can happen. And this is the way that we deal with life. And so I want to I want to connect that with, I mean, you have a plan of what your daughter's going to turn out like, who she's going to marry, the relationships, your sons. But then there's life, like what just happened with us. The audio goes out. Maybe the video goes out. 
And it's not the things that you plan, but it's the things that actually happen. How are you able to navigate that with a 17 year old daughter and, you know, uh, early twenties sons? Well, my boys are uh, 15. Okay, so 15. Oh, they're younger. Oldest. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So how are yeah, you so How are you navigating? Because now you're in it with all of them then. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I really think it just boils down to letting them know that they're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Like no kid's going to go through all of life and not make a mistake. I don't want my kids to go through life and not make a mistake because then they don't learn anything. And I hope that they use me as a resource that when they do make a mistake, they can come to me and say, dad, I messed up, how do I fix this? Right? And I, that I've given them some type of a moral basis so that they know that when they've done something wrong and that they have the desire to fix it if they do. Um, those are the opportunities for us to learn. Those are the things that make us who we are so that when somebody writes our obituary at the end of our lives, they can say he was or she was X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z happened because mistakes were made, rough times were had, and life happened. Um, I was on a, an airplane and we had just this last week and we were flying uh, uh, transcontinental over the Atlantic Ocean and we had some pretty good turbulence. And I was kind of in that mindset of like, you know, um, I think a lot of times we feel turbulence and then we give up. We're like, oh, I'm dead. You know, like this is, this is it for me. Right. And then we give up and we forget that we're still on the plane and we are still moving in the direction that we intended to go. Uh, there's turbulence along the way. And sometimes it's scary. Um, sometimes that turbulence comes as a result of other people's choices. And sometimes it comes as a result of our own poor choices. And if, uh, we just recognize that there is not a person on earth who gets to escape life without making a mistake, that we normalize that. I think a lot of times in our society and the pressures that we place on our kids, they feel this overwhelming pressure, especially if you're a successful person, that they have to be better than their dad or that they have to be better than their mother. They can't just be who they are. They should be able to just be who they are, choose their own path and know that 100% of the time I've got their back. No matter what they do or what mistakes they make, I love them unconditionally and there's nothing that they can do that will make me love them any less. So the billion dollar question, Kirk, is this sounds amazing. Like you're, you're incredible. Okay. So what do you do when your uh, daughter starts ba dating a bonehead? Do you go into like super calm, chill Kirk, or do you go into like 10? You know what I'm saying? Because if she brings home this dude and you can see it right off the bat, does Kirk go into like, you know, protection mode, or do you go into, you know, make your decisions, baby, and kind of work through it? Because I'm trying to figure this out, man. I got a 14 year old. And I'm about to come into it. So what do you do? You choke him. You yeah, choke him out. Um, you choke him out. <laughs> My daughter is dating uh, her first boyfriend, and luckily he is a gentleman, and um, I don't have any reason to not like the kid. <laughs> um, as much as I want a reason to not like the kid because it's <laughs> like the first, you know, she, it, it's her first boyfriend. It's really the first, she's the first one in my home to date. And so um, I think it's just important that, uh, you know, we have an open conversation about expectations. Um, he knows, I, he knows that what my expectations are, you know, if, if we have, uh, if we have curfew, we expect it to be met. Um, I expect her to be treated the way that I would treat her if she was with me. Um, and so I think setting some of those expectations, but you know what, <laughs> if it's a complete bonehead and he's like, Hey, Mr. Chug, like whatever, you know, I haven't dealt with that yet. And that's when, um, that's the test of our metal, right? That when we can say all of these nice things, we can say, you know, I love you no matter what. Well, I love you no matter what, even when you're a bonehead, 
um, is a harder is a harder uh, conversation to have, and it's an even harder thought to wrap your head around. That um, you know, I, I I love you for you, and I I am here for you. You're going to make decisions, and not all of them I'm going to agree with. But um, if you really do, and I think most people do, love their kids unconditionally. They need to know that, they need to hear it, and then they feel it by the way that you react when things don't go quite as planned. You are awesome, man. Uh, so I started the podcast because of my kids. Uh, I wanted to take iconic people like yourself. I call you a superhero. Um, iconic person like yourself, and I wanted to show my kids that there's no idols. There's just icons. And the difference between an idol and an icon is you worship an idol, and that becomes the focal point, which I don't want my kids doing that to anybody. There's also icons that you could look at and you could be inspired by. I think you're an iconic person that, and when I take these, uh, these iconic people like yourself on the podcast, I want my kids to see that you're not a superhero, that you're actually just a human being and you have a phenomenal work ethic and you have a phenomenal attitude. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both of their names, Uncle Kirk, it would be awesome. Maddox and McKenna, my advice for you is to find joy in life and then make sure others find joy through the way you live. Um, I love that. Um, I love that advice because it treats, it makes you see your own worth and it shows the worth of others as well because um, you have to love yourself before you can love other people. And if we can love ourselves, love other people and love God, um, that's the trifecta of happiness. Kirk, you have been absolutely phenomenal. I want to I want to thank you for being on the podcast, man. I I, I want you on more and more, um, guys. This is not a guy who I interview. This is a friend of mine, and uh, this is this is a man who inspires me to no end. The Gentleman Project podcast, haberdasher, custom clothing. I mean, you're going to have to apply, like uh, like Kirk said, if you're going to if you're going to wear the haberdasher brand, you're going to be, you, you know, you're making a relationship. You ain't just making a transaction. Um, but I want to thank you because being on the podcast, like this is blowing my mind, man. We haven't got a chance to be able to spend this much time together, and um, I could tell you, and I want to I want to give you that personal testimony. Who I experience when the mic is not on and the cameras are not on, is who I experience today. And every single person out there that's listening that you've been inspired by this man, this is not lip service. This is not him saying, oh, well, these are all the things that you should do, but I'm not doing. These are the things that he's doing because I see him when the lights aren't on. And I want to compliment you on that, man. And you are absolutely a phenomenal human being. Well, uh, thank you. One of the things I need to work on is being able to accept a compliment because I find it extremely difficult. Um, because I, I, I feel, I think like most of your listeners do, that every day is a struggle to be who I say I am, right? And when you're, when you're true to who you say you are, that's a definition of integrity. And there's times where I feel like I fall short of that. And so if I don't want anybody who listened to the podcast today to feel like, less than because um, of the way that I presented myself or the way that you presented me. I am 100% human. I am 100% full of mistakes. Um, and my, my, my paradigm shift was uh, pay attention, ask questions, and then act on the feedback that I get through those um, questions and um, just try to, try to be just a little bit better. Uh, every day and the podcast is my way of uh, surrounding myself with other icons um, so very similar to your podcast um, I become a better person when I surround myself with people that are purposeful and that's my goal in life is to be um, a repository for good ideas and if, if I can help uh, in, in any way, if I can impact just one person uh, through the work that we do, uh, one tiny idea that's shared by someone or myself um, that will make you a more purposeful, 
person, a more purposeful parent in your life, to have a relationship. Those are the things that last generationally. And uh, if it happens just one time, it's worth all the hours and uh, everything that we put into it. So hopefully something that got said today uh, impacts somebody that listens. Um, and I guess this is out there for the, the rest of time on the internet. So um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's, uh, you know, you can, you can splice out the, the five minutes of technical difficulties. I think it was an awesome conversation and I really love and appreciate uh, the, the person that you are and the good that you bring into the world, Kelly. Uh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's been an honor. Oh, you got it, man. For those of you listening on audio, there was technical difficulties, but I'm not going to cut it out. I'm not going to cut it out. I'm not going to edit it out because we don't have the ability to be able to do that in life. And a lot of times when we run into a challenge, everyone wants to edit out all the ums, the ahs, the likes, and the things and make it absolutely perfect, but that's not the way that life is. And I want to encourage every single one of you out there, and I want to expand on something that you just said, Kirk. Because when you said, like, you have a tough time uh, receiving um, compliments, and we just had this discussion in our men's group today, and a person said, my wife's love language is blank, 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 and it's not words of affirmation. And I said, I'm challenging it. And I'm challenging every one of you out there who says that your love language is not words of affirmation. And I challenge you with that because that is because of conditioning, because you have not heard enough just how awesome you are, because there is not a person on this earth, not one, that when encouraged doesn't light up but it has to be specific. And I believe that every single person out there has a love language of words of affirmation, but some people deny it because they haven't heard it enough because they're not hearing it specifically, Kirk. They're not hearing, Kirk, you are the most amazing, like one of the most amazing men that I've ever met. And when you hear that over and over and over, then it starts to enter your heart. And the reason why I say this is because I grew up with two parents that said it all the time. And they didn't say it out of lip service. They said it out of from their heart every single day. And when people ask me, like, you know, how can you deal with the circumstances, like the technical difficulty that we have here with the recording? Because my mom and dad told me three things I shared with you on the podcast. You're awesome every day. You're beautiful. Don't compare yourself to anyone. And you could do anything. But just because you could do it doesn't make it your purpose. But I want to encourage every one of you out there that's listening, and I want to encourage you, Kirk. Go and give true encouragement to every single person around and watch how they perform. There's not a person on the earth that will not respond positively from you telling them something great about them, but it has to be specific. It can't just be lip service. It can't just be the hands. It can't be just the mind. It's got to come from the heart. So... I know I get strong on these things uh, th this way, and I generally don't, uh, Kirk, but well, I, I want to tell you, man, you need to be lifted up every single day because the things that you do, the project that you have with your podcast, your podcast is not just a legacy for now. It's a legacy for men to be able to have a blueprint for us to look at and say like, wow, this stuff is possible. It's possible to be married for 50 years. You know, it's possible to be married for 50 years from your grandparents to then your to your then your parents and then to you and then your kids can be married that long and your kids can be loved and they can be lifted up. You can have the type of business that you want. You can have three times the amount of revenue and still have your heart in the right place. And you have showed us that today. And I just want to, dude, my hat's off to you. You are incredible. Um, now's the time. That every single one of you out there listening, you know what you need to do. You need to check out the sponsors. You need to click the links. You need to do the stuff. And I want to thank every single one of you out there because you got us in the, because of you listening, watching, sharing, and working through technical difficulties, you got us in the top 1% of all podcasts globally. And I want to thank you. Um, again, check out the podcast. Do that stuff. Kirk, you're amazing. And you're officially off the hot seat.